Oh boy, are you in for a treat today. I'm going to master an entire track from start to finish just for you. Hey, it's Marcus from Hollow Sweet. So a lot of people have asked for it. I finally tried to put something together for you. I hope you enjoy it. This is mastering of a full track all the way from soup to nuts. I'm going to take you through all the tools that I use, the way that I work, and stick around to the end where I kind of tie the whole thing together and give you a little bit of kind of mindset tips about mastering particularly for experimental and ambient music. And if you are interested in mastering your own music, you might want to grab a copy of my free mastering checklist. The link's in the description below, in addition to all of my other free resources that I've designed specifically for mixing and mastering and releasing ambient and experimental music. Please do check them out. All right, on with the show. So before we get started, let's look at my setup. So of course, to start with, I am sitting in a pretty heavily treated room. I also am using a small monitoring console, which has the ability to turn off my speakers one at a time. I can switch them to mono. Um, I can use, I'm using a very small amount of room EQ as well to compensate for the acoustics of the room. Um, I am also using a sound pressure level meter app. This one's just called Sound Meter. Um, it's a free Android app and it will basically just tell you what the sound pressure level is so that I can keep my monitoring constant. I try and keep it at about 80 dB or thereabouts um, to keep everything as consistent as possible. And then in terms of my software, uh, on the very tippy top of everything, I have Perception AB, which is a gain staging plugin. So it allows you to switch between your pre, which is the untreated signal, and your post, which will be the post treatment signal so that we can compare the master to the original pre master without having any volume differences so that we can tell whether what I've done is an improvement. Under that, I've got my correlometer, which is floating down here. And the correlometer will show me whether things are in or out of phase. So it checks the phase correlation. And then uh, over in the far corner here, I have the Pro L2 by FabFilter, which is a limiter. And I'm actually not using this as a limiter. I've got the gain all the way down. And I'm just using this to check the luffs of the track as I'm working, because I quite like the luffs meter in this. And I'm also using the short-term LUTs today. And in terms of my mastering chain, this is the standard template that I use. So at the very bottom here, this is the uh, complementary plugin that goes with my Perception AB control. So this monitors the original pre-master signal. So that was B, that, as you can see here, is what pre matches up with and as we go to listen, so whenever we click on this, we'll be hearing the original untreated signal because this is right at the top of the chain. Next, I have the FabFilter Pro Q3 EQ. Um, I've just put a very basic um, low cut on here at 20 hertz. This is just the standard um, uh, to make sure that there's no low end that's going to mess up anyone's systems because I can't hear below 20 hertz. And um, the human ear can't hear below 20 hertz, so it's usually not really worth keeping that much in um, unless, for example, someone's got an immense amount of sub. Next, I have the Pulsar Massive, which is a digital emulation of the Manly Massive Passive Analog EQ. Um, this, I'm going to switch to mid-side mode, and I have taken the link off, so I will be using this side, we'll be adjusting the mid-channel, and the right side will be adjusting the side channel. This also has uh, a little bit of drive on it. I usually keep it at about 50%. It's got some nice filters in here, low pass and high pass filters that I might use as well. Uh, next, I have my Puig Tech EQs. So these are emulations of the Pultec analog EQs. This one deals mostly with the low frequencies and the higher frequencies. And this kind of deals with more mids. Next, I've got Split EQ, which allows me to EQ the transients and the sustained part of a track separately. Then I have Gem Dopamine. This is like a tape saturation emulation that I occasionally use in very small amounts um, to just add a little bit more top end to things, um, usually very, very gently. This is the Drama S73, which is a soft tube emulation of a multi-band mastering compressor 
which is fantastic. And I often use this one very, very gently as well. It's got this fancy thing called air, which just adds a little bit of top end to everything and makes it really sparkle. Next is the Fab Filter Pro MB, which is another multi-band compressor. And I also tend to use this very, very gently. The next is the Kotelnikov Gentleman's Edition. So this is a mastering compressor. Then we've got Gelfos, which is an adaptive EQ. So this one basically kind of does its own thing. You turn it on, just kind of guess what the EQ should sound like and adjust it. I usually keep this at about 10% for uh, all of its settings. So it's also running pretty gently. Uh, then I've got Ozone. And the two I usually keep open are the Imager, which hopefully you know by now is all about the stereo width and manipulating and monitoring the stereo width. And Clarity, which is a similar adaptive EQ to Gulfos Master. I like to kind of use them both in tandem to try and uh, get some really nice kind of opening effects in the top end. And then the very last one is my limiter. So I've got smart limits, uh, which I usually barely use. Basically what I've done so far is just to raise the base limit, uh, the base level of my track so that it's just kissing below the limit and not actually doing any limiting so far. And then later on, uh, if I feel like I need to push it, I might uh, raise that limit. But this is basically just a volume control with the added uh, benefit that it will also cut off any kind of surprise peaks that comes through rather than just raising the volume. I like to put it up into the limiter so that it will make sure that nothing kind of flies over the uh, our uh, digital limit, our zero dB. And then the very last thing to note is just hiding under here. Uh, I am running this through another bus which has another version of Pro L2, but this one is actually engaged and it's just there to catch peaks. So it's tr it's got true peak limiting on and I've set it so that the maximum, this, the maximum that will come out of it is negative one dB. Uh, and this is really important as part of the mastering process that we don't have it go all the way up to zero because if we go up to zero, then when we change the encoding to say like MP3, sometimes you'll find that the volume might actually spike past zero dB and go above it. And that will cause distortion. It's something to do with the way that the encoding process reduces the amount of samples. I won't go into that in super detail here today, but just suffice to know that a good rule of thumb is to make sure that the maximum volume of your master is negative one dB. And so I've set that in here. My output is negative one. And this is basically just here, once again, to catch anything that might be missed by the smart limit. It's going to be caught by that FabFilter Pro L2. And the track I'll be working on today is called Absolving by Darren Harris. Uh, this is from his forthcoming LP called Subliminal, uh, which should be out later this year. So if you like it, please do support him. Uh, I'll put a link to his Bandcamp in the description. So please do check him out if you like his music. Let's start off by listening to the entire track start to finish and just get a, a feel for what we're working with.
Beautiful track. I really love that kind of Boards of Canada vibe and how everything's kind of like coming at you from each side one at a time. Uh, I feel like this kind of track is already kind of pretty close to sounding its best. So I'm really going to be gentle on this one. All I really want to do is try to add kind of a little bit more liveliness and um, kind of enhance everything that is in there. I don't want to try and contort this at all. I want it to be, you know, just more of itself, basically. So let's get started. Uh, so because this track is relatively consistent from start to finish, I've just chosen this section here that I'm going to set on a loop so that uh, I can uh, just kind of let it do its thing while I'm working. It'll kind of flip back around so that I don't have to stop and start it again. Um, and let's open up our chain. And first thing I'm going to do is check that I've got my level right. So All right, we're looking pretty good. We're just kissing that top. Wonder if I can add a little bit more. Cool. So our volume's up. Oh, okay. Now it's starting to do things. Cool. All right. So it looks like I guessed right at the start. So limit. It looks like it's fine. I'm gonna let that go. And next thing I'm gonna do is start messing around with my adaptive EQs to see whether they're gonna add anything to the track. So let's start by turning on Gulfos. See whether that makes any difference. Flick back and forth. Okay. Yeah. A little bit more open in the top end. Maybe a little bit too much. I tend to pull this back a little bit here. It always seems to want to take that top end way too high, so I'm just going to pull that back. Let's see what it's doing now. Okay, very subtle. Feels a little bit more open. You can see it's also pulling down a few things where it feels like it might be getting a little bit too extreme, so it's also going to add a little bit more evenness to the track as we go along. Let's have a look at our clarity. So this clarity has this thing called tilt where I believe what it's doing is it's using a noise reference and it's comparing the music that I'm playing to the reference. Now, depending on which way I tilt this, the noise that it's going to use as the reference will change. So I believe when it goes up to this end, it's more like white noise, which is very consistent across the spectrum and everything's this big kind of uh, uh, block. Whereas if I go further across, it starts to tilt the opposite way and then suddenly the top end, it will start, the top end will start coming down and the bottom end will start coming up as we go back. So what I tend to do, particularly with music, uh, with ambient music, because there's not a lot of things happening at the top end, what I might do is actually just pull this down a little bit so that it doesn't try and add more too much top end because otherwise things will start to sound harsh. So let's go again. Start trying about here. And you can see that it's only doing like about a dB of change, but that might just be enough to make it sound a bit more fun. This is the original. And this is the new one. So it's just sounding a little bit area. But it also em emphasizing the kind of texture in the noise as it's swishing across, which I think kind of gives a bit more emphasis to it. So it's the original. Just a little, little bit. Cool. All right. So we've added a tiny little bit. And notice, like I've said here, I'm doing like very small amounts. So this is going up a dB or so. Golfos, I think, is doing a little bit more. Oh, no, it's probably also about one or two dB. If that's one and a half, then this is about one. So, yeah, key to mastering everything should be subtle because what we're doing, what the aim of the mastering process is, is that by in subtle increments, we are improving the sound because we're working with a stereo file. 
and any adjustment we make is going to affect everything. You can't just change one particular instrument in the mastering phase. It's going to have knock-on effects to everything else that's in that mix. So we need to try and make the adjustments as subtle as possible so that uh, that balance doesn't get thrown out too much. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes we may want to change the balance a little bit if we're feeling that something is um, not sitting the way that it should. But really, we want to try and make those subtle adjustments because they're going to uh, kind of knock rock the boat when we're trying to um, add polish to that track. All right, so we've added a little bit. Turn my volume down slightly. So what I might do now is just tinker around a little bit with the EQ to see if I can kind of sweeten it. Um, the massive passive is really good for this. Um, I can push it quite far before it makes, uh, before it kind of ruins the sound. So I find that having adding a little bit of a, um, a boost in some areas will give you uh, a bit more of everything without ruining the track. So let's start in the kind of low mids, which is where the power is in ambient music. So at around this 390-ish mark here, the 400 hertz, I tend to just push the gain all the way up and then just move it around until it sounds good. We've been down at about 300 hertz, it's pretty good. And then I just turn it back until I'm happy sounds like and then we can turn it off to see whether that made any difference okay a little bit more fullness I might try something in the mids uh, on the sides at around the same position so we go to about 300 I try and choose a different frequency between the mid channel and the side channel when I'm making these adjustments because if we make them the same, it's going to make things sound a little bit flat. But if you slightly change those, you end up with a contrast, right? So if this one's sitting at around 300 hertz, I might make this slightly above or slightly below so that there's a slight contrast between the mids and the sides. And that's one of the other things that kind of gives you that magic feeling of space and separation. So. Let's go with this 380, that'll do. Let's go back. So if you notice here, it says that I've added like 6.6 .6 dB of gain, but it doesn't really feel like it's done that much. Let's have a quick listen. That's off. That's on. That's on. It's amazing how far you can push this thing and it not actually really do much. It's a, a real testament to the design of this EQ and one day I'd love to have the hardware version. Um, but yeah, it's the, the kind of thing where I really like analog EQs because you are, it stops you being conscious about how far you're pushing things. You're just focusing on what makes it sound good. Let's turn this off to see what kind of difference we're making. So let's listen to the without the effect on. And with the effect on. So it's just a little bit, right? Suddenly that kind of higher, the, uh, that one, it's popping out just a little bit more. So all these little increments are like adding a bit more kind of excitement to the track. So let's listen to what difference I've made overall so far. So we'll go back to the pre-master. And then to the master. Pre-master. Master. 
So still very, very subtle things. And I'll do a bit more EQ in the, the massive, I think, just to see whether I can get any more fun things happening towards the upper mids and the top end. Um, but yeah, like all these little things just kind of make it feel a little bit more alive and a little bit bigger and a little bit more lush. Just like all these little increments. All right, let's just have a look at the top end. I don't want to mess with this too much because it's already quite bright, but... 1K is another area where I find is like a good place to enhance ambient music. Just a little bit. A little bit lower than that. Okay, let's see what the difference is. Like it's added a little bit more roundness and a bit more kind of body to the mids like very gently um and uh i think that's kind of gives it an even more like warm sound so that's the magic of that kind of four three to four hundred hertz range and that one kilohertz range are two areas that i really love to kind of try and sweeten a little bit All right, now in terms of the dynamics of the track, I think this is actually quite, um, I think they're actually pretty good. What I might try and do now is I find that at the top end, it's feeling quite dynamic, but the mids kind of don't have any, they don't feel like there's a lot going on in there. So what I might try and do is I'll go and look at my multiband and I might try and just pull down the top end just a tiny bit and see if I can enhance the mids a little bit more so that um, they feel like they're moving more in step with each other. So I'm going to open my favorite, the Fab Filter Pro and B. And I'm going to make a filter on the top end around here. See if I can get it to like just kind of just just a little bit. Just a little bit. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Pretty slow attack, pretty slow release, so it's not gonna do a lot, it's just gonna just gently kind of touch it. Just every now and then. Too much. No, still too much. Yeah. Get up that range. If I'm looking for like around one ish, maybe two dB of reduction, so not a lot. Any more than that, and it gets really noticeable. So when I'm using compression, I'm trying not to do more than like one to two dB at a time. If I do need to do more than one to two dB at a time, You've got to be really careful because that's when you start to hear the compression happening. When you're in the small amounts, it doesn't make a huge difference. It, you'll be able to hear it when you flick back and forth, but when you try and go above that 1 to 2 dB, that's when you have to start really dialing in your attack and release because it will become very obvious what you're doing. And if you get it wrong, it could be what makes or breaks the song. So just be really careful with the way that you are doing this. If you're mastering your own music, I would recommend that if you have to use more than a couple of dB, then you should go back to the mix and look at what might need to be compressed in the mix, right? And now I'm gonna add uh, one around here. Oops, uh, it's gonna connect up here. And that's doing way too much stuff. And I'm going to set this to expand, just very gently. And expansion is the opposite of compression, right? It's actually adding dynamics. So when the, when the volume crosses a certain threshold, instead of bringing it 
down like it does in compression. It will actually push it up. So what we'll get then is this new counterbalance where the top end will be coming down when it's trying to push up and the mids will be pushing up when they need a little bit more of a boost in volume. So let's see if we can get it to, to bring a little bit of like interplay between those two in. notes are starting to pop out a bit more and that's what I was looking for somewhere in the mids that was like the the notes were starting to pop out a bit too much so I wanted to kind of scale that back a bit which is why I've moved it so now we've got the top end is coming down every now and then and that kind of the kind of upper end of the bass is starting to push up so if we turn that off again Super, super subtle. We're just getting a little bit more movement. A little bit more movement in that bass. So I am just going to tinker with a few more things to see whether there's anything else that I can add to this track. But I think we're pretty close to finishing. I really don't want to mess around with this too much more. Um, because I think Darren has already done such a good job of the mix of this track. And also because... Um, particularly with a track that has this kind of hazy vibe, it really is easy to overdo it, particularly in the top end, um, where suddenly what was kind of, what had like a mellow feeling suddenly becomes like quite uh, um, grating. So the one thing that I haven't touched on yet, which I love to rant about, is stereo width. So let's have a look at our imager to see how wide the stereo is. And if you've probably been watching along at the Coralometer and it's saying that it's actually pretty good. Everything's pretty much in phase. Um, so let's just have a look uh, to see what imager says about that. And look at that, we've got a pretty good spread. It's relatively concentrated towards the middle here and then occasionally it comes out towards the edges. What I might, mess around with that I like to what I might mess around with that I like to fill her with sometimes is widening it widening it ever so subtly um my favorite setting on this is the in space and if you are using the full paid version of imager particularly I think this is ozone 11's version you have this uh, amount slider, which means that you can choose the wet dry mix, um, which means that if I want to go super subtle, I can bring it all the way down to, you know, percent or something just to get a little bit more width. Um, and then you won't mess with stereo image too much. Let's just see whether it makes any difference. So I'm going to start back at 0% here. Sounds 
light with it off. Pretty negligible difference, but now yeah, I'm going to keep it. Nothing wrong with adding a little bit of width as long as you're not ruining the phase. I'm going to try it one more time. Off. And just listen overall to what we've done. So I'm gonna go back to the pre-master and then to the master. So you can feel it's a bit warmer now. Um, obviously a little, a little bit wider. Go back to the original. It sounds a bit more flat. Sounds a bit more 3D and slightly a bit more lively. Um, I might, last thing, just do my drama. Let's go for a uh, neutral. Let's try wide mix. Oh, yeah, that's too wide. This one's tricky. To my ears, it sounds like they're roughly at the same volume. I am doing this just by ear. And if I'm turning it on, it kind of sounds like there's a little bit more presence in the mids, but it could just be in my head. Let's try it one more time. That's off and on. could just be in my head but I like it so I'm just gonna leave it and then we'll check against the limiter in a minute to make sure that that hasn't boosted the volume too much um, and then we'll obviously hear the whole effect in a minute when we go back to check the whole thing uh, yeah drama does some kind of fun things in very subtle ways so even if it is just a volume thing it's it won't hurt to keep it on for now uh, let's see if my air thing doesn't Let's just see what that sounds like to the overall master. So that's master, the original. But now this sounds kind of like a bit boxier and a bit honkier. We go to the master. Feels a bit more open. It still has that warmth. This is the original again, Foxia, Master. Okay, so I just 
took a little bit of time offline to adjust some of the settings that I've been using just to kind of really dial it in and feel like I've got it to where I want it to be. So let's have one more listen to the original. And the master. I tweaked the settings on this a little bit and uh, so that I brought this back down a little bit, brought this up a little bit, went back to the massive and added a little bit more in the low mids area there. So I feel like it's now got a bit more of a kind of a full sound, but also with a bit more kind of clarity and airiness. The last thing I did was a tiny, tiny little boost at 16 kilohertz or like 0.5 dB uh, using my pull tech. I'll just show you what that sounds like if I kind of boost it a bit higher. I'll just go all the way up. So it's basically just that noise, really. So it's added a little bit to the noise, but it also makes it feel a bit more open. So I think I am pretty much ready to call this. Uh, I am just going to double check my limiter to make sure that it's not engaging because I think if you look down the bottom here, we're, we're hitting about negative 12 luffs, I think, momentary. Yeah, 11, 12. We're in a pretty good spot. I haven't touched, I barely touched the dynamics at all. Um, and I don't think it's going to need anything. Look, there's just a little bit of an Bring it down the touch. I think that the dynamics are, are just perfect. They don't need um, anything done to them. The last thing I'm going to do before I render this down is to check the fade in and fade out. Very carefully listen to the original fade in to make sure that it's right. Yeah, it sounds pretty good. And I think the fade out might need a little bit of work. So. That cuts off a little bit. So what I might do is add a little fade to the end of this. Our region. So when I go to render, um, it'll only render the part of the track. And so that's about it. Um, after I'm done here, I'm going to render it down. I tend to then take my tracks into Wave Lab, Steinberg Wave Lab, um, because it's a really easy way to add metadata and make sure, for example, that the album's all lined up correctly. It allows me to export to whatever different combinations of formats, sample rates, bit rates that I like. Um, I'm not going to go into that in this tutorial. And then once I've bounced it out of Wave Lab, I'm going to take it to a variety of different uh, listening situations to make sure that it sounds right, you know, the headphones, the home system, the car, the earbuds, um, a few different ways to make sure that I'm not overdoing it in any particular part of the frequency range to make sure that the dynamics match what I'm hearing in my speakers in the studio. And then once I've done there, uh, off it goes to the client for their review and to let me know if I've, you know, gotten things the way that they want. So after watching this video, you might be thinking to yourself, gosh, it seemed like he was just messing around a bunch. That doesn't seem 
like a particularly professional way to work. And to that, I would answer that this is one of the most important things about mastering for ambient or experimental music is that there is no one size fits all approach to this kind of music. And so my process is a very creative one. I have to try a bunch of different things and I decide whether they are having a good effect or not. If I feel that it's added to the track, if I feel that it's making the track more like itself, then I'll keep it. And if it's not doing the job, I'll take it away. There are some very basic things that I'm going to be doing, and then there are a lot of processes for particular things that are very percussive heavy that I will use very specific kinds of processes on. But a lot of the rest of the time, it really is experimentation. This is one of the things that I like the most about mastering for experimental music is that every time I'm bringing the same set of tools, but I get to use them in, in different ways to different amounts uh, to, to enhance a track. So it's important to note that while it does seem like I might just be mucking around, that the tools that I'm using are ones that I've used quite a lot before. I know how to get certain effects by adjusting them in certain ways. And so I'm using this, I'm using my ear training and in conjunction with everything that I've got, you know, my treatment in my room, my slight EQ adjustment, my experience, all of these things are coming together to make this look pretty easy. But bear in mind that uh, if you're trying to master your own music, particularly, especially if you don't have a lot of experience with this kind of thing, it can look like coming to this conclusion was very simple, but you may find in your situation that you may be struggling, trying to work out whether what you've done has actually improved the track. And that's one of the hardest parts of mastering is knowing when you have added to the track and knowing whether you have gone too far, whether you have changed the track into something that it shouldn't be. Um, so if you are trying this for yourself, please bear in mind that it takes a long time to get good at knowing when a track is done or whether a track is improved. And if you are in that kind of spot where you have iterated 10 times and you still can't work out whether you've done the right thing, it's a good time to hand it over to someone else who might have a better idea of where to take things. So that's what I'm here for. So if you are trying to master your own music and you do get stuck, you can't work out whether what you've done is right, you take it to all these different places and it sounds different everywhere and I can't really work out whether they've really nailed that bass, don't be afraid to send it over to me and I will let you know from my experience whether I think it is where you want it to be or whether there's some way to take that to another level. So please don't forget to take advantage of my low-cost feedback service if you're in that position. All right, for those who've made it all the way through to the end, you are my true fans. Thank you so much for hanging around. Please start your comments with the word pro because if you follow what I've done in this video, you're gonna be a pro in no time. And if you liked what you saw and you wanna see more of this kind of thing, please don't forget to subscribe. Hit that bell button so you get those notifications when I release new videos. Don't forget to check the links in the description for all those free resources. And if you're looking for more, here are some other videos that might help you with your mixing and mastering journey. Until next time, keep making music. Cheers.